I just wanted to, uh, to tell uh, who that was, because that was a subject that we uh, touched before in the, in our own show here. Uh, this guy is uh, Gleb Pienich, who is one of the most iconic uh, TV journalists uh, uh, in Russia. He uh, was the most popular host from 2000. Ilya, you froze up on us. Oh, we lost him. Okay, I'm going to keep talking till he comes back. Uh, I think I have to uninvite him here. Hold on a sec. We'll wait for Ilya to come back. Um, and I very much want to hear what he was just saying because there he is. He's back. Hold on a sec. Let me re uh, re welcome you, Ilya. Hold on a sec. You should be getting that pop up. I, sorry, I, I don't know what, 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 what did happen, but it, it just reloaded for a minute. So, so he joined uh, the station already after, uh, Putin started a major crackdown on free media in, in Russia. So he was consciously accepting, uh, the proposition in, uh, uh which was coming from Putin's uh, authorities being a free journalist. Yeah, he is, uh, that Lakes was talking about the free media and whatever, and I was questioning him how that combines uh uh together and uh uh funny enough uh in 2012 uh, he was eventually fired and his show was closed despite very high ratings um uh, and now he lives in istanbul even though not being able to be to be in russia so we were uh reflecting on all those changes in uh, in, in in russian media you know it's interesting in a, in the in the west we tend to think of business is being run purely on a pop profit motive, right? Good ratings equals good advertising equals we want to continue with that show. And just that little story you just told us really points out that in some parts of the world and in some systems, you know, it's not follow the money, it's follow something else. And in this case, I suspect it's follow the preservation of power. Absolutely. Absolutely. For uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, national TV is his uh, major levers of power. That's why yes. they are very closely monitored. And he, uh, before this escalation, this stage of war started in, in 2022, before that, he even allowed a little bit in uh, internet, a little bit in printed media, a little bit in the radio, but not on the national TV. National TV was uh, something that he started to control from the very first day in, uh, it was actually his first step when he became Russian president. He was elected mm -hmm. in, in, in the year 2000 formally. So he was inaugurated, um, like May 10th, I, I may be mistaken, but beginning of May, uh, 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 in the year 2000 and by May 15th, he started a major attack on the most influential, uh, uh private, uh, TV, uh, TV station, this, uh, and TV actually where where Gleb was working later. Hmm. So this brings me to a really interesting point. And before you joined us, I was talking about your interview on, on uh, conflict zone, the TV interview in Germany. And you said a couple of things, or you covered a couple of things in that interview that were really interesting to me. One, if we have time to get to it was the discussion of good Russians versus bad Russians. I was really fascinated okay. by that, but before we go there and, and I think it's kind of tied in together. You know, you began to talk with the host about civil war in Russia, and we've never talked about that here. You don't hear a lot of discussion about it in the Western media. Let, let's talk about that. And is that something that's a new subject of discussion or development in Russia, or has this been on the table for a long time? I would say that Russia already is living in the situation of cold, uh, civil war, uh, because, uh, uh, in the situation when there is no politics and when the only answer to popular resistance is, uh, brutal oppression, uh, it is the cold war, but we don't call it a cold war when it's uh, like a tiny minority, which is doing something and 
then overwhelming majority that goes uh, another way. And in this time, in, in, in this situation, we call it just repressions. Mm -hmm. uh, we can call it totalitarian regime or whatever. Russian regime is not totalitarian. Uh, Putin uh, is not a dictator. Uh, uh, because uh, the difference between totalitarianism and autocracy is that in totalitarian regime, you are actually mandated to think in a certain way. Mm -hmm. In autocratic regime, you can think whatever you want and you can actually freely talk to your relatives, for example, at your kitchen, uh, uh about this and that, but you shouldn't express this in, in public, uh, you would, you would be punished, punished for this, but in general, you can think whatever you want, uh, totalitarianism is not. So, uh, uh, Russia right now is an autocracy, but it's uh, it's a very divided autocracy. It's, uh, the autocracy where the, uh, uh ruling regime at the best, at that very best, has 60% uh, of uh, popular support. Mm, uh, it's uh, uh, not seen on the elections because they are uh, uh, doing actually great job in manipulating people, in alienating certain circles of the society, making them not taking part of the, in the election and in the political process, it, it, it doesn't matter what, what they actually do, but as the result, uh, uh, this 60% actually, uh, are allowed to uh, run the country, uh, completely, but that doesn't mean that another 40%, uh, uh has disappeared. And, uh, that's why I'm right now talking about the situation of the cold war, because after they invaded into uh, Ukraine, if this like 40% people, they still had their own theaters, their own printed media, not much, a little bit, uh, you know, but, uh, they had their own radio station, just one called Tefa Moskvi, but they had something, you know, they had one TV channel, which was working in uh, YouTube called TV rain, uh, but uh, nevertheless it's existed, right? It, they could uh, move freely uh, in, in the world, uh, uh, from one country to another, it, it still existed. Right now, it's uh, it's a real censorship because right now it's a criminal case if you are saying something against the war. That's yes. why, from just uh, you know discontent uh, and people being upset, the situation moved in the situation of the civil war. When there is us or them, we cannot coexist. There's no no longer any way to coexist. It's either we defeat them or they would defeat us. No no alternative. Well, and so you also just described the situation between Russia and Ukraine, right? I mean, there, there, I think everybody agrees now there's not going to be a compromise. Somebody's going to win. Mm. And you're saying the same thing in the scenario of a possible civil war. Are you able to describe, is it possible to categorize who would be on each side of civil war? Is, is that even possible? Um. You know, in the situation of civil war, uh, in 1917 in Russia, um, in, uh, in general, people like to portray it like there was red army and the white army, mm -hmm. uh, but in the reality, it was way more fragmented, uh, because, uh, people who, uh, disliked, uh, uh, the Tsar regime, they were fragmented and people who tended to defend them, they also were fragmented. Uh, people who were like pro-revolutionary at the, at the very beginning, that included, of course, Bolsheviks, uh, but uh, it included other type of communists called Mensheviki, uh, uh, there was another type, and then there were anarchists, and then there were socialists, and socialists in, in, in their turn were also divided. And then there were uh, liberal Democrats, which tended to be more with Bolsheviks originally, but then they got split and some of them stayed with Bolsheviks, but some of them moved more to the white army. In the white army, there were mon monarchists, but, uh, there were different bourgeois parties who were originally was, uh, assisting to overthrow the Tsar. So it was very, very much fragmented. And there were many cases when one village it was taken once by Bolsheviks, then by nationalists, then by socialists, mm. then by liberals, you know, and they all were fighting, uh, uh with each other. And I think that, uh, right now, well, it's a very, uh, high probability 
that in general, the political, uh, space would be as fragmented as it was at that time, at least in the, uh, radical opposition, uh, we definitely see, uh, three different, uh, groups and one group is what is uh, usually displayed by, uh, uh, mass media. And these are urban liberals. Uh, that's the most pro Western nice audience, you know, youngsters, hipsters, uh, you know, uh, globalized, uh, uh, circles of the society. But the problem is that, uh, those guys are very much against Putin and against the war, but they're not ready to fight. Uh, they are the people who are for peaceful protests, nonviolent action, you know, uh, with some flowers, uh, with some balloons, uh, you know, but, uh, not, uh, with the guns and, uh, Putin is uh, using this for his advantage because for him. If you are unarmed, that means that you are weak and that you are afraid and you can be oppressed. Uh, to other groups of people, they both are opposed to Vladimir Putin, but one group is, uh, like, uh, low circles of the society and, uh, they disagree with Putin because of economics, because they live uh, very poorly, badly, uh, uh, they are disconnected from the major um, uh, economic sources within the society, they're very frustrated, uh, and, uh, 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 they really, they want to revolt, uh, because they want to be the beneficiaries of the economy and, uh, uh and not, uh, those who are oppressed, uh, they have a lot of jobless people there, uh, you know, a lot of people on low paying jobs, uh, uh so precariat. Uh, yes. I, I wouldn't use the, the word proletariat here because again, it's more fragmented and more, more, uh, uh, uh difficult uh, to define, but precariat would be, uh, the, the right term to describe this audience. And the third group is the opposition, which is actually coming from, um, uh, the totally other angle. They are like more Putinist than Putin. They're criticizing mm -hmm. Putin for being too pro-Western, uh, too weak too moderate, uh, uh, too corrupt, uh, uh, they can tolerate him for, uh, uh, going at war with Ukraine. Actually they praise that uh, he went at war because they want to restore Russian empire. Um, um, uh, this group is not uh, dominating the society at all, but none of them, uh, none of them does. Uh, I would say that if we measure those three groups, uh, they would be more or less equal in size. And I will measure them all at like 15%, uh, uh, of the population. I would say that around 50% right now is this, uh, silent, uh, uh silent, uh, majority, uh, very inert, uh, and, uh, this, uh, 45, 50%, uh, is, uh, radical, uh, circles who want the change. Um, but which are fighting with each other and that allows Putin to use this, uh, majority to run the country. So is this really, do you think a civil war is really likely in the short term? I mean, do you, it is, is Russia a powder keg or is this more of an academic discussion? Uh, I think that what is very likely, uh, very likely is popular revolt, but, uh, it can be successful only in the situation when it's supported from the top. We need to have certain parts of the elites, which would be supporting the popular uprising. That's what happened, uh, all the times in the past, even in Ukraine with Maidan revolution, Maidan revolution would not be possible if there would, was no part of the elites was actually actively, uh, supporting it. And in, in, in Russia, the situation is, uh, absolutely the same. So I think that, uh, elites, uh, would start get more and more scared of this popular revolt, uh, revolt from below and being scared, uh, they would try to initiate some change, uh, whether it's a violent change, whether it's a peaceful change, uh, certain transition of power or whatever, but they would need to react on, uh, this, uh, popular uprising, because otherwise it would be 1917 for them. And, yes. uh, they, 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 they will recognize this spirit. This ghost uh, is uh, speaking in Mark's uh, words, uh, which would be wondering, 
uh, in in Russia. But if they would not react, if it would continue like this, then uh, yes, it can be very messy and very bloody uh, with the popular uprising from below. So to a large degree, what you're saying about the elites is, and I guess this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, they're going to do what's in their best self-interest. Absolutely. That, that, that's normal. And actually that's yes. the best situation that you can predict somebody's actions when you, you create a construction where hey, it's, it's good for him. You know, you should, you should yes. create at the end of the day, a win-win situation, not, uh, not a lose-lose or win-lose. Well, except in some game. Yeah. Except in, in the current situation, a lot of people are losing. So that's not really the calculus in the current system. But, uh, that's, uh, what is working for the change. That's exactly my point. Exactly. You know, when, when so many people are losing, uh, people are starting to get frustrated and that, uh, creates prerequisites for the change. That's, uh, that's exactly my point. So where does, Fe where does, uh, February morning fit into this? Because obviously information, disinformation, misinformation, propaganda plays a huge role in this whole conversation. And you are running a TV network from inside of Ukraine for Russians. How, how do you see February, how do you see February morning fitting into this? And, and do you have a goal or is your goal simply to give people the most accurate information that you can? Well, obviously my goal is the change. Uh, and, uh, my goal is to facilitate the change and support the change. Uh, and, uh, organize the change. Uh, uh that's why I'm doing this. It's, uh, it's not a traditional journalism, it's activism. Uh, yes. uh obviously, uh, informing people is, is, uh, the significant part, uh, of, of the change, but it's not the only one. Um, and, uh, right now what, uh, we are doing at, and trying to do at our best is to learn uh, how to talk to exactly to those frustrated circles of people because they are so alienated, you know, with liberals, uh, it's not so difficult to speak, uh, but they live in their own bubble and a lot of those liberals, they, uh, tend to just leave the country and, mm -hmm. uh, and not stay in there to fight and, uh, to other groups, they, they cannot leave the country. And, uh, uh, there is not much of information sources that they have. They, uh, actually very much abandoned, uh, and it's the only official TV, uh, propaganda we, 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 which is talking to them and that's very bad. And that's what we want to substitute at least at part being the voice for those people. But, uh, obviously there are a lot of technical, uh, problems in achieving this objective because, uh, there are, there are very few journalists who can do it. Uh, yes. none of them are in Ukraine, obviously, um, uh, we have a lot of people here who are very radical, you know, a lot of Russians who are very committed to fight and to overthrow that regime, but they are of a different breed and, uh, uh, and we need to find more people who can talk to those, uh, lower circles of the society. So do you see action in this direction, civil war, are we seeing it now? For instance, you sent me an article, uh, and I shared it with everybody about essentially people bombing cars of people in the government. Last week we talked about a suicide drone that blew up a refinery. Um, is this a growing movement? And again, what is the role of February morning? in supporting or facilitating those kinds of actions to bring about change? Um, uh, in terms of our role, uh, it's uh, obviously, you know, to bring those people in the spotlight uh, and that's what they want. Mm. That's what they need yes. uh, because uh, they uh, want and they can uh, lead people by example. And uh, we need to explain why it is important and why it makes uh, all the difference uh and to uh to tell people that that's uh that's the that's the trend and uh that among even certain youth radical groups it's becoming fashionable 
It's like uh, in Germany in 1970s, uh, Rota Army Fraktion, uh, you know, it's uh, Red Brigades, even <laughs> which more yes. uh, organized there. Uh, that's, uh, that's the direction it goes. And uh, I believe it would play a lot of role in, in Russia. Obviously, it may turn into different directions. It may remain uh, just uh, a radical outburst, uh, which would fade away. Uh, uh, but that would be possible if the system would be capable of adapting. And right now it's, uh, instead of being flexible, they are becoming more and more rigid. Yes. Um, uh, they just, they, they, uh, shut down, uh, the most, uh, popular, uh, liberal theater in Moscow. And that mm -hmm. was like an island for, uh, I would say conformist liberals, you know, those liberals who Okay, it's all bad what is happening, but at least we have, you know, our small community here and uh, there are people whom we like, we can, we, 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 we live our separate life. We just, we don't go out there. We don't want to see what's happening in our government. We can do it here. And, uh, so now they are thrown on the streets and, uh, just another major illusion is gone. And obviously they would, uh, join our ranks because again, what, so what else uh, they can do? Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting in the article you sent me, and I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna put this in the uh, chat again, hang on here. Let me grab this. Um, I realized one of the points of this article is that it was really saying to people, I mean, blatantly, explicitly, if you feel the same way we do, and you're willing to carry out an act against the government to make change. You are not alone. I took that away as a huge part of this. You are not oh. alone. Come join the rest of us and you don't have to do this by yourself. And it seems to me that that must be a large function of February morning is showing people that you're not alone. Absolutely. That's very important uh, because uh, one of the uh, fundamental problems of Russian protest movement is that it's weak. It's literally weak. Uh, it, uh, cannot resist the police. It cannot protect, uh, uh, anybody who is joining this movement. Uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely powerless and, uh, nobody wants to be the part of the weakness. Yes. Uh, everybody wants to be the part of strength. Um, and, uh, that's what we're trying to say people. And that's why we're trying to highlight uh, all this, uh, you know, right now also pretty, uh, I would say, uh, pointless actions like uh, arsons, you know, what, what can you achieve with arsons? Yes. Nothing, but you, you demonstrate that there are people who can act yes. and, uh, if, if they can put, uh, uh, military outpost on fire or uh, or police cars on fire, uh, or, uh, pro-war activists, uh, uh, that means that, uh, they, uh, feel them things th themselves strong and they can protect others. Um, and together we are strength, we are strengthening us. Uh, and that's obviously the message that needs to be delivered. And we, we hear, we see, we feel how it's being picked up. Well, so, and to follow up on, on you describing this as weak, it's important to not ignore the fact that it's weak because it's oppressed. I mean, even if it's strong without outlets to communicate and connect, it, it is, it feels like you're in a weak position, even if there are more of you than, than you realize. So this is all by design that it, it's weak because it's designed to be kept weak. And one of the things you're doing with February morning is empowering people to realize, oh, we actually have more power. We have more numbers than, than we could have thought by just following the media inside of our own country. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, that's the point because, uh, you know, when you are going on a peaceful rally, you see each other Yeah, and at least you, you see the numbers. Yes. And I remember that feeling when, uh, the movement was rapidly growing and we were like, wow, you know, the, yesterday we had 1000, today we have 10,000, tomorrow.